and this goes over your ear. So then it's not so easy to to put in it under the loop, but just make sure the mic's outside. All right, that sounds good. Make sure it looks good. Okay. Yep. You can just attach that to a pocket or something with a little strap. <laughs> All right, welcome to the opening session. And uh, we have the speaker order. Just who the, the um, who's the presentations in order? Serena, where is that? So our first speaker this morning will be a good friend and colleague, Charlie Bristow, uh, over in the UK. And uh, will I be able to see that presentation here? As soon as he shares. Okay, Charlie, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, you want to do it from this end? Wait. Try now, Charlie. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Yep. So Charlie's going to give us um, his experience in the Bodelli Depression in uh, one of the dustiest places on earth and experiences from the field. Very remote, very hostile. Yep, it sure was. Go ahead, um, Charlie. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so it's so a slightly different uh, perspective from the normal uh, presentations you give about your field work where it concentrates on the results. Uh, in this case, uh, I get to talk a little bit about uh, some of the logistics and um, what it takes to actually uh, get there and make measurements and some of the things uh, that we experienced uh, in doing so. Um, so I have to uh, give credit to uh, my co-workers and it's not advancing for some reason. Yes. Yes. Right, so um, we were part of a team. Uh, that team uh, was put together uh, by Andrew Warren and um, we all came with very varying backgrounds and Andrew actually invited me to join the, the group to bring the radar along, the ground penetration radar. Uh, and I took one or two look, looks at the logistics and decided, no, it wasn't going to be suitable to take the radar, but I would go along as a geologist anyway. Uh, and it turned out that was probably the right thing because the Bedelli was particularly hostile uh, for any sort of electronic uh, instruments that we had. So those of you uh, don't know where it is, the Bedelli Depression is in northern Chad. Uh, it's a low-lying area um, which shows up on uh, satellites uh, as a area with a high albedance, albedo, so it's got a high reflectance. Uh, you can sort of see that um, white dot in the middle there. And you can see the white dot, the pale area there uh, is an area of diatomite, which was a, a lake bed. And this was the remains of a lake that used to extend for about a thousand kilometers from Lake Chad in the south right up to uh, the Tibesti in the north. So at that time, it would have covered most of, of Chad. And it's a particularly uh, difficult to, to access, uh, but we knew from the satellite images that it was producing a large amount of, of dust and uh, using a combination of uh, MODIS satellites. This is gonna go down, come on. Okay, for some reason my slides aren't forwarding, which is a bit odd. Oh, here we go. Um, you can see the uh, plumes of dust uh, that are coming from the Bedelli, and uh, this was producing around 100 events every year, particularly during the winter months. Uh, so using the um, remote sensing, uh, two different uh, satellites, 
um, the, the MODIS, um, which is the uh, ozone uh, spectrometer. Um, that identified the Bedelli as the single biggest source of atmospheric mineral dust on Earth. And then you can see the, the dust plumes coming out uh, on the, from, the, from the plume heading driven by the northeasterly Harmattan winds. So we know the sort of the, the where and from repeat satellite uh, data, particularly the uh, meteorological satellites that give da daily coverage, we could say when, uh, particularly during the winter months, every, um, you know, it was, it was every three or four days effectively during the winter months. But we didn't know much about the, the how and the why. And um, we didn't really know much about what was going on on the ground. So we needed that ground truth. And this is um, a nice uh, false color composite um, that was these Mr. Mr. Sids that were available at that time. Um, you can see the area of the Bedelli, uh, which is uh, blue in the Mr. Sids. And this is the, the lake bed sediments again. And um, an Angama Delta towards the north, um, maybe more relevant to uh, some other exploration on, on Mars at the moment. Um, and then we, we, we were trying to then say, okay, so we need some ground truth. We've got to check what's on the ground. Uh, and that was part of my sort of role as a geologist. But we had no idea what to expect. And one of, our, one of the team who had been into um, the desert in, in Niger said it, it could be like a powder puff, that there would be just a, a big pile of dust. Uh, and as soon as we drove into it, uh, the vehicles would be bogged down and we wouldn't be able to drive across it. Um, and not long before then, this is um, 2002, uh, Richard Burns in his WRC uh, car got stuck uh, in, a, in a big bowl of dust uh, just outside the, the pits there, uh, and he had to retire from the uh, African Spire Rally as a result. Um, so we were, we were very cautious about what we were going to be able to do, uh, and would the vehicles sync up their axes, would be able to, to actually do much in, of exploration while we were in the field. As it turned out, it was, it was not like that at all. Uh, this is the lake bed and you can see that it's actually uh, very hard, uh, quite rocky to, to drive over, very, very difficult, um, but not insurmountable as long as you, you took it gently. Uh, that area, the high albedo is uh, diatomite. The diatomite particles have a very low density so they're very easily entrained by the wind. So even particles, and you can sort of just about make out on the, uh, in the foreground here, particles of a, a centimeter or two, uh, are readily blown by the wind within the Fideli because it's a, a low density material. And I think that's something that, that we hadn't really sort of figured quite how low density that atomite was um, and how easy it was for the sand, the quartz sand to abrade the surface. And, and so it's kind of like, we were making it sort of like a just-in-time dust production. As soon as the wind moves, the sand starts rotating, and that's what sets the dust off because the, the sand abrades the bed and breaks it up. Certainly something we, we, wouldn't re we would not have known about those sort of mechanisms with, without going there. Now, this is our camp at Chicha, um, which we selected um, because it's uh, got a tree which gives us some shade and there was also access to groundwater so we could have uh, drinking water. Again, you can sort of see what the uh, surface materials were like, uh, this mixture of, of broken up diatomite and sand uh, in sort of sheets and patches, readily mobilized by the wind and then intervening uh, lake bed diatomite. There was a, a major dust storm while we were there. Um, this is the, the camp during the dust storm visibility uh, decreases. And uh, most of the time we were sort of huddled inside vehicles or, or tents. Uh, that was the remains of our tents. So our nice, neat encampment. Um, after a dust storm, everything is completely flattened. Uh, our tents were completely buried. And um, yeah, uh, we, we could have collected a lot of uh, uh, dust and diatomite just by uh, taking the tents home. Um, that dust gets everywhere. So it gets into your eyes, it gets into your ears, it gets nose, mouth, 
anything you, you drink. Um, standing behind the vehicle there is the cook. Uh, so he's trying to cook in the shelter of the, uh, using the, the back of the Land Cruiser for, for shelter. But obviously uh, that, that's going to go in your food. It's going to go into everything. So you, you're eating it, you're drinking it. Electronic devices were particularly vulnerable. Um, you know, you're probably familiar with the idea of electrostatic dust traps. Well, pretty much anything you turn it on, uh, it becomes an electrostatic dust trap. Um, solar panels, well, we, we didn't have solar panels on this trip. We, we considered it, um, but they were too big uh, and heavy at that time, too cumbersome uh, for, for us to ship out. Uh, so we, we were relying on a, um, uh, a small generator in the field for, for power. It's just enough to uh, charge up laptops. I guess the other side of it is that uh, if you were trying to collect samples, uh, contamination is going to be an issue there. Um, one, on one hand, you know, the dust is easy to collect because it's everywhere. Um, and if you have a dust storm on Mars, you're going to have conditions like this. Uh, it's going to be difficult not to collect dust. Uh, but the trouble is the dust is going to get into everything. Other pieces of equipment that worked, uh, the microtops for uh, measuring the uh, um, amount of sunlight. So what was obscured by, by dust or clouds, uh, that one worked. Uh, Simul, which is the automated one, used to stop working every afternoon because it got too hot uh, and also had to be shut down um, during the dust storms uh, because of the problems of saltating sand uh, damaging the lenses on, on the Simul. Uh, but the handheld devices tended to be more reliable than uh, the, the bigger, in bigger instruments. Uh, for the dust traps themselves, uh, these little um, modified uh, Wilson and Cook um, dust traps um, worked remarkably well. I've, I've since seen some sort of experimental results saying they're only 65% efficient, but uh, that they are efficient across a wide range of, of grain sizes, uh, which is pretty much what we've got. Um, and we had these attached to uh, plastic towers. Uh, you can sort of kind of see the response of the plastic towers here to the wind that they, they took on a, a bit of a lean. Um, but they're very simple and very effective. Uh, an, an inlet and an outlet uh, and a, basically a stilling chamber uh, inside the sample bottle, which uh, collected the dust um, and no moving parts. They don't need any electricity. Uh, so simple worked extremely well um, in that environment. Uh, the MET stations also uh, stood up uh, very well, and uh, this shows uh, the wind speed. Uh, once it got up about uh, 10 meters per second, that's when the, the dust uh, was, was being generated. Uh, so you can see there a period uh, from the 8th, 9th, 10th of March, uh, increasing winds during that period, uh, which was the dust storm that we experienced there. Uh, and, and the MET stations continued to work well. Uh, also, optical instruments, uh, in this case, uh, an optical theodolite uh, with a very simple um, balloon tracking system that, that worked during the day and night. Uh, they put a little tea light into a plastic cup uh, beneath the balloons to work at night, uh, and they were able to track that remarkably. Um, you'll see the distances on there. That's, that's in uh, going up to elevations of uh, six thousand meters uh, and during during the night time uh, so it, was, it, it worked remarkably well this is one of the one of the plots I like um, which is, shows the temperature change the diurnal temperature change as well as the wind velocity uh, on the 8th of March there you'll see the range of temperatures from from 16 degrees C to 43 uh, so this is, this is why the, uh, the, the simul stopped working. Uh, the shade temperature was 43. If you, if you stick your instrument out in the sunshine, 
the temperature on the ground is is well over 50. Uh, and so it stopped working in, in the afternoons. It just got too hot. A there's of minutes quite, left, Charlie. Thank you. Um, there's quite a good uh, shade effect. Um, you can see there that the, 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 on the 10th, when it's the uh, height of the um, dust storm, then the range in temperatures is much less. Uh, it's 22 to, to 31. The meteorologist with us said, well, you can't really just sort of take that at face value because there could be other synoptic things going on. Um, but it gives you an indication of the amount of, of uh, shading potentially that the uh, the dust storm was creating. So uh, this is just a sort of a brief uh, rundown of the equipment there that the uh, the, the simul uh, failed because it overheated, um, but most of the other things worked. Uh, one I haven't mentioned was the kite. Uh, they took a kite uh, to take uh, atmospheric measurements uh, and also to try and take some, some photographs. Uh, and this crashed. Uh, on the lines uh, broke on its first flight, so um, that was a that was a write off. And most of the vehicles failed. Um, so let's just go on. That's the Angamma Delta as it is at the present day. So here's here's a summary of what happened to the vehicles. Uh, one of them a wheel fell off. Uh, one of them the suspension broke. Uh, one of them uh, differential broke. Uh, that's a brown one. Uh, one of them hit a cow. Um, and that wasn't with any of the science party, but we did have a journalist from, from uh, Nature magazine with us, and he went home early, and it was that car that, that hit a cow. But the passengers and driver were perfectly all right. And even my super reliable Toyota Hilux, uh, which I traveled around, I managed to cross the, the Bedelli, uh, I think at least twice, um, there and back, eventually died on the way home, uh, because its diesel injectors got blocked by dust. So um, there you are, a few, few tales from the field um, to, to give you an illustration of, of what it can be like uh, when you start to venture off into uh, some remote areas. Uh, often it was the, the simplest pieces of equipment that worked well. Um, I did have a slide in there about boots on the ground. Uh, my planetary colleagues are very keen on, on manned uh, space exploration and uh, having that uh, ability to make decisions and to change what you're doing on in the field in real time is really useful. Um, but I, I don't, that's probably not going to happen in Mars, certainly not in my lifetime. Uh, but they are very keen to send people back to the moon, at least from my from people I know. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, keep it simple um, and. Um, that was, I guess, uh, the, the fundamental message from uh, our experiences in Fidelity. Great, thank you, Charlie. That's the hostility of that environment uh, is fierce. And oh yes. <laughs> it, uh, it may bode well that anybody who really wants to put a Mars level stress on stuff, on instruments, might want to consider that kind of level of exposure. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Cynthia Dinwiddie. And if you want to share your screen, Charlie, can you close your sharing? Yes, and I, Cynthia, I you're currently muted. And Cynthia, you're muted? Yeah, Cynthia, you'll need to uh, unmute yourself. I don't, I don't know if you have a mic set up or not. Oh, I think you're good. You're... Yep, it looks like you're unmuted. We just, we have, we have to hear you. So I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize I had to control it from two spots. So sorry for that. Um, you have my slides, right? Can you load those up? Yes.
she asked am i the advancer okay and and uh, cynthia when you want to advance just give me a cue and i will advance the okay. slides okay sounds good uh, so i'm cynthia dinwiddie i'm a staff scientist at southwest research institute in our san antonio offices uh, please advance the slide Uh, advances. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm a hydrogeologist, and um, this presentation is going to go through a number of different uh, aspects of of surface atmosphere volatile interaction parameters and measurement devices and methodologies. So uh, I hope you find it interesting. Um, first, we're going to talk about a couple of parameters that are important because planetary bodies like Earth breathe their variable pressure atmospheres in and out through their porous surfaces and substrates. And this is called diurnal and weather-induced barometric pumping. And so to account for advection, not just diffusion of the atmosphere into and out of the subsurface, uh, parameters like the effective permeability and porosity of the near surface to local volatiles is important. Um, just like a little primer here, the intrinsic permeability is only a function of the porous material. It has nothing to do with the fluid that might be flowing through it. And then the, the effective permeability is a measure of the ability of a specific fluid phase like oil or gas or brine to flow in a porous material in the presence of other fluid phases. So sometimes we have two phase flow, three phase flow and multi-phase flow uh, in one porous medium. And then the relative permeability is a multiplier of the intrinsic permeability. It ranges from zero to one and it's used to calculate effective permeability. So the pore structure and the formation wettability are both affecting the, that value of relative permeability. Now, a terrestrial analog example as a groundwater hydrogeologist, um, you know, hydraulic conductivity then can be calculated as basically the intrinsic permeability times the relative permeability to water. If it's fully saturated, that would be one times the density of water times your gravity of your planet divided by the viscosity of water. Uh, the intrinsic and effective permeabilities have units of length squared, or in the oil and gas industry, these are called Darcy's, or they're, they're translated to Darcy's. Hydraulic conductivity or gas conductivity has units of length per unit time, like meters per day. Um, this is a sub-discipline sub that's known as petrophysics. Uh, it's, it's a big deal in the oil and gas industries, environmental industries, because I'm an environmental scientist and water resource industries. So next slide. Next slide. Yeah, it's getting a slow response here. Okay. I'm not getting any response. Uh oh. Uh, I just share my screen then, I guess. Okay, it's back oh. online. <laughs> okay, so um, so here we are. We're going to talk about um, a, a method of looking at hydraulic conductivity and some problems that were discovered with its usage, and then how how we've basically kind of matured the instrument and provided much better usage guidance than there was in the beginning in the beginning so the electromagnetic borehole flow meter uses faraday's law to measure the water flow rate through this instrument that is pulled incrementally up a borehole within an aquifer and this instrument enables the calculation of the vertical distribution of the horizontal hydraulic conductivity along a well bore so in this image, um, we have basically um, an aquifer that's been divided into N layers. And this aquifer in this model has a constant saturated conductivity. But 
um, because of the flow redistribution that happens inside this instrument or that happens in the aquifer system because of the head loss through the instrument, you get this implication that there's a, always a higher saturated conductivity at the top of your well bore. So we, we looked at, we basically built a, sort of a two-story tall um, borehole in our high bay and we measured the head loss through this electromagnetic borehole flow meter. And um, the head loss then is a function of the, the amount of flow that is going through the meter. So uh, my colleagues Foley and then later Arnold measured these head losses. Uh, a couple of EBFs, they have different diameters. And so the smaller the diameter, the greater the head loss. So, you know, we came up with a bunch of uh, kind of cautionary tales on how to use this instrument. It's better to use the largest diameter instrument. Sometimes you might want to use it without a, a borehole packer. Um, basically the instrument itself is causing kind of a change in the flow field. So you've got to be very careful about how you're, how you're interpreting your data and make sure that you're not um, just falsely accepting the fact that the highest permeabilities are always at the top of the aquifer, which makes no sense, of course. Um, sometimes wells are, a lot of times the water supplies wells have a gravel pack uh, right around the well bore. And so in that case, you might be using a packer to pack off or seal your flow meter into the well bore, but you're short circuiting um, the entire uh, flow meter itself because you've got that very permeable gravel pack. So. This is uh, my first work with with modeling instruments and um, really kind of doing the footwork needed to to take an instrument like this and um, kind of help help point the direction of making it into a much the utility much higher than it was to begin with. It came out of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Then we're going to go into a new instrument that we built. Uh, we were dealing with some a natural analog to heavy oil sands out in California. And what we discovered, well, a lot of times on, on Earth, the rocks and sediments are exposed to the atmosphere at the surface. And so they undergo weathering. This results in property modifications. And so unless you're actually really wanting to know what that hydraulic property is at the surface, which I acknowledge in a planetary context, you probably do. In a, in a groundwater or oil and gas context, you don't really know, you don't want to know what the weathered property is. You wanna know what the in situ property is buried down deep in your reservoir. And so testing surface exposures for, for permeability can be inadvisable unless you have that need. So um, we were in this, heavy oil sand analog and it was a very poorly consolidated sandstone. Uh, the sandstone up at the top of the outcrop was cross bedded sandstone and down at the bottom it was a bioturbated sandstone but it was uh, very friable and it was challenging to retrieve core plugs that we could take back to the lab where we could measure the properties on it on sort of the back end of the core where it would not have been weathered. So because of this, um, we developed this pneumatic device called the small drill hole mini permeameter to measure the small scale effective gas permeability of these fry friable materials in situ. So we take a masonry drill bit and we drill basically four inches deep. It's a very easy process in these kinds of friable materials. Uh, numerically, the work I did, um, if you could advance one more time, the work that I did determined geometrical factors, uh, kind of for the whole geometry of the drill hole probe and the flow system. And then this geometrical factor is used to invert the gas flow rate and the measured injection pressure to calculate the permeability. I also determined what the averaging volume of the probe was in various configurations using its spatial weighting function, which you see in that, that new little rainbow colored uh, schematic there shows you how the permeameter, um, the, the gas flow would be coming out here and it's flowing around the seal. 
And so basically you have a very non-linear weighting. And so the most important aspects of that measurement are coming from where those cool colors are. So, you know, we can, we can take a look at um, basically 74% of the total weight of a given measurement is contained within this color shape map. Uh, next slide. So next we're going to go into how we use this device, uh, not in that heavy oil sands analog. I didn't go into that, but um, in the faulted and fractured non-welded bishop tuff, we use this as a natural analog to the paintbrush tub at Yucca Mountain, which is a, a it was a proposed geologic repository in Nevada. So the Department of Energy had taken credit for this non-welded tuff located above the repository um, as a natural barrier because it's it's matrix dominated flow. It doesn't quite have as many faults and fractures as the more welded ignimbrite. So it was really thought to shed water laterally down slope, kind of like an umbrella, kind of um, stopping up wa infiltrating water from above um, and then moving it kind of down slope and away from the repository. So uh, because, because we work, you know, for the regulatory agency, we're contractors of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, then we were motivated to consider both the primary and the secondary heterogeneities of these materials. So this is really kind of a combination of, yes, hydrogeology on the one hand and structural geology on the other. So um, although the matrix permeability of non-welded tough may be relatively homogeneous, yeah, you can advance um, to where it's like about 100 to 300 millidarcies, fairly consistent. In fact, in this slide over here, you can see where I've identified the host rock is a very kind of consistent um, fairly impermeable and not very interesting, uh, <laughs> not very interesting in terms of its hetero heterogeneity. But as you get closer to this fault, uh, which is at the Chalk Cove at the southern end of the Bishop Tuff, then you can see that the permeability is much more variable. And then as we go um, kind of up fault, the permeability became even greater. And so you can see kind of the, the number of fractures within a 20 centimeter bin at around the same locations where we put in these drill holes and then measured permeability. Now, some of the challenges were that in this particular poorly cohesive rock, the seal pressure against the drill hole sometimes caused the grains to compress, the drill holes to then widen and gas to leak. And so also when you're dealing with um, a drill hole that is basically intersecting open fractures, then there's an there can be an inability to supply the gas at a sufficiently high rate uh, that would actually preclude the highest permeability, you know, measurements of your highest permeability in, in situ because those large open fractures are intersecting the averaging volume of the instrument. Next slide. Um, so then uh, just uh, le probably less than a mile down the road um, on this Chalk Cove, Chalk Cove Road at the Bishop Tuff, there is an underlying sequence that lies below the Bishop Tuff. There's a 110 meter long cut bank. You're seeing about 16 meters of it right now in the slide, but uh, there's a 110 meter long cut bank. It's an exposure of thinly bedded, uh, thinly bedded sequence of fluvially reworked glass mountain tuffaceous sediments and asphalt tephras. It's been deformed by two oppositely dipping two meter scale displacement normal faults that bound a horse. And you'll see that in a minute. We were again motivated to consider both the primary, which is sort of the primary heterogeneity is just what was in this formation before it ever, um, before it ever went, underwent any stress deformation. And then the secondary heterogeneity is what is the heterogeneity that's in place on the top of the primary that is really due to those faults and fractures. So into this mix, we added both electrical resistivity and ground penetrating radar surveys on the road uh, in front of this exposure to get greater insight into these secondary heterogeneities. Um, next, next slide. Uh, 
Okay, so um, this gives you kind of an idea of, you know, sort of an overall view of this um, 110 meter cut bank exposure. You can see how the crucifix fault is over there on the left. The reason why this is called the crucifix site in the first place is because there's a little, oh, please go back. Right. Because there's a little uh, memorial that has, back one more. Yeah, there's a little memorial that has been placed up here, uh, likely because of a car accident that happened in this area. So that's that's why it's got that name. But um, so the area in which we did the permeability measurements is sort of in this elliptical area that is in the foot wall of the crucifix fault. There's these crossing conjugate faults that are very interesting in this area. You can see there's an asymmetric deformation where between the crucifix fault and that cross memorial, there's 47 faults. And then over on the right-hand side, there's only 14 faults. So it's, it's not a, a very symmetric bunch of deformation, but you can see we've got the ground penetrating radar and we've got the, um, the multi-electrode resistivity. Also, um, there were some sub-horizontal beds that were mapped below the road from an 11 meter thick exposure. Uh, so the next slide then. Yeah, so this is just uh, looking a little in a little bit more detail at the geophysical data that were collected from this site. Um, you can kind of see how we've taken the visible, the visible faults that are above the road and sort of translated them down to what we think is going on here in the subsurface based on the geophysical data. Uh, next slide. So in this foot wall block, um, we have a lot, there's a lot more uh, higher permeabilities in like that first six meters in the, in the foot wall. And then beyond the six meter distance, the permeabilities throughout the remainder of this first, uh, this upper bed are pretty well represented by the geometric mean. Now the data that are read, those indicate that those holes were intersecting some fractures. And so those were not actually included in the geometric mean because it's a hybrid measurement. Um, again, in the, in the second bed, you can kind of see the drill holes so you can see the beds that we were working in. In the drill holes below, um, again, there's higher than geometric mean permeabilities really in that first six meters and around the, the relay ramp and the conjugate fault zones. And then um, here in this lower bed, there's lower than geometric mean permeability dominating the rest of the transect from six to 16 and a half meters. Um, so there's both higher and lower permeability values that were measured at this crucifix site than were measured at the previous Chop Cove site. Um, the, of course, the highest permeability faults and fractures we didn't actually measure at the Chop Cove site. There are fewer permeability measurements. You can see that we got fewer measurements in the first six meters. And that's because it was you know, kind of so chewed up that it wasn't always possible to, to get as many measurements as we wanted. So although those measurements are sparser in the first six meters, uh, you can see that there's definitely higher than the average K values. Um, next slide. Okay, got uh, two minutes left. Okay. All right. Well, um, a lot of folks in this group have over the years seen <laughs> some of the work that we've conducted out at the Great Kobuk Sand Dunes. So, um, the rest of the presentation was going to, to be on this material. NASA funded us to test geophysical methods that are applicable to Mars in a relevant geophysical analog environment. Uh, this means that it was both cold and frozen, migration rates are very low, the, dune, uh, the dunes are terrain bound, kind of like an intercranar inter dunes that are so common to Mars. The dunes are decoupled from the atmospheric forcing by snow covers two thirds of each year. And everything is surrounded by ice wedge polygons um, out in the basically north and east of the dune field. So our work lays a foundation for understanding these controlling factors on cold climate, sand mobility and transport. Next slide. 
Okay, so just uh, like a real quick passage through some of our field sites. Uh, what you're looking at here, if you can see my cursor, um, is this over here at this precipitation ridge. Um, this is our first site. It's, it's not a very high ridge, but we did find liquid water beneath the frozen Arctic, um, beneath the frozen active layer out in these dunes. Um, we have both resistivity. Uh, we were not using, you know, galvanically coupled resistivity in this environment. We were using capacitively coupled resistivity. Um, these methods are, are very, very good at identifying what's going on in the subsurface in cold climates. And I think that they should probably be used um, on a lot more Mars missions. Next slide. So we also con conducted real-time kinematic DGP GPS surveys, and we hand augured tin boreholes to provide ground truth for what we were looking at with the geophysics. The field work took place under near maximum freeze conditions. Uh, next slide. So um, can you wrap okay. up, please? Yes, uh, sure. Um, basically, uh, just you want to continue on to the end, we'll get over to some meteorological stuff. Just want to forward. And one more. Uh, one more. <laughs> Thanks. One more. Okay, so um, at this site, we did deploy a bunch of meteorological stations, and we can talk about that in more detail, you know, during a discussion period. But I just wanted to show you some of the data that we collected in situ. Uh, and in combination, there was a fire weather station that uh, the National Park Service has just three kilometers from uh, one margin of the dune field. So, um, I did, uh, I did quite a bit of numerical modeling uh, associated with this system. The numerical modeling for the, it's a non-isothermal cryospheric model. It did show that the perched water in the dune field could, could uh, be there simply based on like an ice lens that forms below the active layer itself. And these data were, or these models were forced by um, the ROS data because we have, you know, probably 20 years worth of, of daily data from the RAW station. Um, and that's about it. We can talk about other things at some other time later in the meeting. All right, thank you, Cynthia. So we are going to move, thank, thank you presenters. And we're now going to move into the discussion um, section. Um, and basically we'd like to hear your comments on, you know, what terrestrial methods or measurements or methods are most directly analogous for our, our planetary colleagues, and then and then what can we learn from this? Do we have any questions or comments from within the room here? Yeah, hi, this is Brian. Um, I would like to hear a little more about these microtops and maybe what kind of things we could learn from those because I, I get I get the impression from the conversation online that these are essentially solar cells, um, and it seems like this is the kind of experiment that we have done essentially on on Mars with with solar cells already on landers. So I'd like to hear a little bit about what what could we learn from those kinds of measurements here on the Earth and how would how would we translate those kinds of conclusions into onto some a place like Mars. Um, Charlie, if you're there, can you give us a brief um, information on, on what a microtops principle of operation, how it uh, works? I'm not sure I can tell you how it works. I can tell you what it does. Um, it's a, a photometer. So you basically you aim it at the sun and then you measure the, uh, the amount of, of the intensity of the sunlight. Um, you can work out theoretically what the intensity of the sunlight should be at any point on Earth's surface at any point in time. And then 
given the difference between what you measure and what the theoretical value is, then you get an indication of, of the amount of sunlight that is being obscured in the atmosphere. So in this case, um, how much dust uh, would be in the atmosphere or potentially clouds. And uh, it measures at a, a, a number of discrete wavelengths. Uh, so you can use that then to, to um, model whether it was dust or clouds, and then potentially what the size of those dust particles might be, depending on the uh, wavelengths that are being blocked between uh, the, the sun that's, that in theory would, would get to you on the surface and, and then what you're measuring with your microtopes. Brian, you have a, a follow on? Yeah, I see Ralph has gotten some good chat. Ch Ralph, are you able to share your comments verbally or just over chat? Um, let's see. I'm not sure how good this mic is. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the microtops things are are basically uh, spectrally selective photometers. I think the one that is pointed out has like five channels. So from the ratio of one channel that's in the water vapor absorption band, you can actually get pollen water vapor. Um, and there's some algorithm for estimating uh, aerosol and optical depth again from the ratio. The microtops thing, you, if I recall correctly, you, you sort of aim at the sun during this kind of a, you know, just a little reticle. Um, so in effect, it's equivalent to the photodiode detectors that are on uh, LADA and uh, LENS on, on the three Mars rovers. Um, you know, the measurements I've done with solar arrays um, and with, with Brian in, in the field, have just been broadband detectors that, that aren't spectrally selected. But um, on Mars, you can use some of the spectral ratios to um, pull out, I think, ozone column depth, and uh, as well as maybe water vapor. Question from the floor. Hi, I've got a question on behalf of uh, Jeff Balchewski. It's interesting that the porosity of the near surface material ranging from tens of centimeters to meters is discarded in terrestrial environments. It seems like this surface porosity might be very relevant in planetary environments, i.e. due to impact gardening or poor closure due to volcanism. Yeah, I take your point. So I think in the planetary realm, it's going to be very important, right? Because we're talking about um, things like uh, frost, frost volatiles moving in and out, you know, seasonally and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's just, you know, that's not something that we're dealing with when we're dealing with water supply issues or, or contaminant transport, all of that kind of thing happens down where the groundwater is saturated. I'm also a Vado zone hydrologist, so to me it, it is interesting, but um, you know, that's, that's kind of the thought process is that if you're dealing with producing oil and gas from a reservoir that's a thousand feet down, you wanna know what that in-situ data is. You're not as concerned with how the atmosphere is interacting with the top, top of the planet. Yet, you know, the physics is all the same, so, which is why I bring it up. Also a question for Cynthia from Joel Sankey. Could you please discuss whether there are space or airborne remote sensing methods that can adequately measure near surface permeability and hydraulic conductivity? Yeah, the answer to that would be no. <laughs> um, I mean, aside, aside from making some educated guesses at what the materials are and how they were in place. So if you can kind of use your remote sensing to identify the, the type of porous media that you, you have at the surface, uh, but really this is one of those types of measurements that is, it's critical to do it in situ because it's, I think it's, fairly hand wavy um, when you're dealing with a different planet that has a different gravity and we just don't actually understand the pore structure until we go down there and take a look at it in one way or another. Uh, 
All right, there's a, another online question or more of a comment from Steve Metzger. Uh, I strive to collect every reasonable measurement in my terrestrial analog world work so that the off-world planetary folks can have the relevant data by which they can translate results to their conditions. And that might often mean including um, measure, instruments and measurements that aren't exactly needed for one's focus, one's own focus. So I guess it's, it's sort of a, it's on us to start looking at those cross instrument links that give us supplementary information for our own interests, which makes it relative, pretty important that those links are, are developed and, and associated so that the engineering people, we can approach the engineering people to figure out you know, how best to put these things together. Oh, this is Cynthia. I 100% agree. When we went out to Kobuk Dunes, you know, we were going out there with really one purpose in mind, and that was, well, what we were funded to do was, you know, to use ground penetrating radar to to look at a Martian analog, Martian geophysical analog. Um, but the opportunity that presented itself was so rare and so amazing that we went out of our way to try to get some internal funding that did not come from NASA so that we could go out there and take our uh, three portable weather stations and, and do a lot of geomorphology work. And we actually expanded well beyond what we had proposed to NASA because the opportunity just kind of demanded it, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, but Ralph, I'm going to echo your point here. Ralph is just saying that um, taking instruments just to see what you find is great for discoveries, but the NASA mission, uh, NASA mission evaluation construct of a traceability matrix is not conducive to this approach. This is a big challenge. You got to justify every every instrument you're putting on a spacecraft. You can't just say, "Wouldn't it be cool if we made this measurement?" Um, yeah, something to think about. Yeah, I mean, I've um, I've, I've snuck a couple of microphones onto my Dragonfly meteorology package, but but I, I did so by justifying them as an engineering diagnostic, not as an open-ended science investigation, because you, you get panned for that in the way things are evaluated. It's, it's sort of sad. And I think it's important that um, everybody knows what's being measured. If you don't know, if you can't have a reference that says, I know what somebody else is doing, you don't want to be the person who wants it added onto yours if it's already available. So again, it, there's communication amongst the instrument people that should be disseminated at, at some level that's easy to find to help, to help the new instrument designer realize they don't need the thermal couple. They've already got a thermal couple. All right. Got a few more minutes for discussion. Yeah, uh, there was, uh, I was gonna bring up, get up here so the camera can see me. Uh, this is Serena. One of the other chats that had gone on earlier uh, during the presentations uh, and kind of in line with what Ralph just brought up with regards to, thank you, the, the instruments um, is how many measurements one needs. Because we can't just throw on more, set. obviously we always want as many data points as possible. So for instance, if we're measuring wind or something in a vertical profile, how many do we need? And there were some good reasons given for three to five measurements, but it's justifying like each one buys down the uncertainty a little more, but each one is another instrument that you have to add to your payload. So I don't know, can we have some discussion on that? Yeah, just to think, follow on what Serena had said, I think um, just think about wind profiles. Yeah, I mean, it's you want to put as many instruments on as you can, but um, you're going to have to justify each one. And so things to think about, I think, are probably redundancy. Like you're going to need enough that if one or two fail, you're still going to get something useful. Um, it, I think it's also useful to think about 
um, how the number of measurements translate into um, quality of inference for the model parameters. So if you're measuring Z naught, your roughness scale, and you made three data points at, you know, with each with their own sort of uncertainties, how accurately are you going to estimate Z naught from that? So that's something we got to think about um, translating that. And I'm Don, I'm going to, I think you're welcome to just unmute yourself. If you want to share your question that you've just chatted. Sure. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Sorry, I was I late. So I missed a bunch of the conversation. Um, I, and I'm not sure if this isn't something that might be covered later in the, in the conversations, but um, hearing this question about, you know, nicely placed terrestrial instrumentation and the reality that at Mars, we usually have it really poorly accommodated, not where you'd want it, uh, way too close to the surface or whatever, uh, for whatever type of measurement. Uh, um, has anybody actually gone and, and taken a whole nice set of really well-deployed terrestrial instruments and put a really crappy mock planetary instrument in, in the same context and compared the results? Probably a no, then. <laughs> but uh, prob probably worthwhile at some level, for sure. Uh, Well, all right, we're in the last minute of our discussion. Uh, I can give one example of, of, of what Don is asking. So on Insight, there was a deployment of some seismic instrumentation out in the plier at Goldstone to, to get kind of, you know, kind of crappy, crappy seismometer uh, measurements. And there, there was, of course, a, a proper seismic vault uh, nearby um, so so that's been done for for seismic on that same experiment um, uh, field campaign uh, there, there was a oh, an anemometer a cup anemometer on a small mast and I did some uh, microphonic wind measurements um, with you know my my dust devil pressure loggers that are just in a box just sitting literally on the floor of the plier um, and um, the, the intercomparison was actually very, very favorable. Um, but, um, you know, that, I think that that sort of exercise is, is one that, that kind of crops up informally, um, but it, it, it's a good point to raise just so people can, you know, attempt to document things better. Um, because if one set of measurements is kind of crappy, you know, it, it's tempting to just discard them if you have what you need. But, making the effort to document exactly how crappy or otherwise they were um, may be worthwhile. Just, just as a comment to that, if I could give an example, I think that um, saltation instruments that are headed in the future to Mars would really, would really benefit from this kind of thing because you, don't, you always get to look at your physical sample on the earth. You better know your sampler can reproduce important information it's best algorithm to get particle size so you can get mass flux. That's something I would really suggest that, um, you know, that has to be a key thing for um, process Aeolian. If you wanna know about saltation on Mars, you better know your instruments is able to reproduce measurements on earth with known um, limitations or whatever before you send it to Mars. You wanna know it's, limited it, it, its limits so just a comment to close the um this section and we're going to have a break for the next um 15 minutes no 20 minutes so we'll reconvene at 